Welcome everyone to the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Hans Boschker, Wolfgang Braun, and Dong Yong Kim from the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research in Stuttgart, Germany. Today they'll be talking in three pieces. We will start with Hans Wilker, who's talking about thermal laser epitaxy. We will then move on to Dong Yong Kim, who's going to talk about oxide epitaxy by TLE or thermal laser epitaxy. And then lastly, we'll have Wolfgang Braun, who will talk about thermal oxide substrate preparation. Um, you may go ahead with your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Hans Bosker, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you. Good afternoon, everybody. And then I'm going to talk about thermal laser epitaxy, which is a new fin film developed technique, which was developed in the last three years in our department. Of course, we didn't do all of this by ourselves. So let me introduce the team. So we are now working with close to 10 people on this topic. And as already introduced, um, this talk splits into three parts. I will first talk about the general principle and the evaporation of metals. A lot of the work of this is done by the person top left here, Thomas Smart, who is a PhD student at our institute. Afterwards, Dong Yong Kim will talk about chromium oxides with this method. And finally, Wolfgang Brown, who, also, who is also essentially the inventor of this technology, will talk about um, high temperature substrate heating. So to start with, what we're interested in is the epitaxy of complex materials. And today I don't want to focus so much on what has been achieved already, but I want to focus on the challenges for the future. And these fall into two main categories. On the one hand, we all want to make better and even better samples. So this means uh, getting smoother interfaces and especially minimizing defect densities in the constituent parts of the layers. On the other hand, we're also enriching the material space. So we grow more and more complex materials. We want to combine different material classes with each other. And this amounts to an exploration of the periodic table. Because the more functionality you want in your structures, the more elements you're going to need. And the absolute limit, of course, for a deposition technique is to be able to deal with all the elements of the periodic table in a very flexible manner. So to start at the first point, one of the issues we have and needs to be improved in the future is composition control. This is an example from my previous research where I worked a lot on an interface between two perovskites, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. And here on the left, you see two cross-section TEM images of LAO STO heterostructures. And on first glance, these two look pretty good and pretty similar. So the bottom here, this is the strontium titanate site. On top here is lanthanum aluminate, and you see that there is perfect epitaxial registry and there is no obvious defects to be found. Nevertheless, if you do composition analysis on these samples, you would find that one is lanthanum rich by about 5%, whereas the other is aluminum rich by about 10%. And this is one of the intrinsic features of the material class we are working with, namely the perovskites, is that they can handle very significant amounts of stoichiometry and still form um, the perovskite crystal structure. In practice, this matters a lot for the properties because we study these interfaces for inert electron system that is being generated. And one of these samples actually has such an interface or such a conducting system. The other is not, it is insulating. And of course, if you Think about any other oxides. If you want to improve the technology, you need a composition control, which is better than this five to 10% shown over here. And if you look at composition control into film growth, it's always good to first look at the epitaxial system where this has been achieved the best. And this is gallium arsenide. And this is done in a method called absorption controlled growth. On the left here is the phase diagram of gallium arsenide, which has three regions at 
low temperatures and high arsenic flux, um, arsenic sticks to the growing to the surface. And you get a sample which is rich in arsenic. At high temperatures and low pressures, uh, arsenic evaporates from gallium arsenide and you're left with a gallium rich surface. But in between, there is a very large window where the sample stays stoichiometric regardless of the flux of arsenic. And this is where MBE growth of gallium arsenide operates. If you would do the same to uh, our materials, and the prototype here is strontium titanate, and our host today uh, has calculated this nicely for us, you get a very similar phase diagram, but everything happens at higher temperatures. So if you want to grow strontium titanate by an absorption controlled growth method, you need temperatures of around 1600 degrees, where you can apply a excess flux of strontium oxide and control the growth rate with a flux of titanium dioxide. In practice, this is not done simply because hardly any system in the world has a substrate heater which is capable of going to these high temperatures. So in a standard system, a heater is limited to about a thousand degrees and you're in this space space over here where everything you put on the surface sticks to the surface. Meaning if you want to control your composition, you need to control the incident fluxes of the components um, to a very high level. And in practice, people then achieve accuracies of around 1% after long optimization. So this is not ideal for high quality growth. Of course, there are reports of absorption controlled growth of oxides in the literature. Um, and recently they were summarized in this paper over here. And there are two main methods how this works. One is if one of the components is volatile. An example would be strontium rufinate, where the rufinium component can evaporate off at relatively low temperatures, meaning around 950 degrees. And the other is to switch from growing in pure beams of metals or oxides to metal organic precursors. For example, the strontium titanate here is grown by supplying titanium as a metal organic. For the cases where this growth mode was successful, the figure of merit of the growth, which is typically in this case an electromobility, which is a good number for defect density, was better than any other film grown this way. So this is clearly favorable, but the problem with this is this is a relatively small set of all the uh, oxides grown up to date. If we go back to the second point, so expansion over the periodic table, this is a periodic table as seen by somebody who does molecular beam epitaxy. There are certain elements uh, which require low operation temperatures, for example, here on the left or in the, in the B-type elements. And here you can directly see why MBE is so successful for free five semiconductors. Um, because these happen to be the materials where um, the, ev um, the evaporation sources work at relatively low temperatures and therefore everything is relatively easy. MBE becomes much harder once the temperatures goes into, for example, this orange zone over here, where you go to up to 2000 degrees, which is by now the upper limit. And then there is a range of materials, including important ones such as carbon, uh, where thermal evaporation in a standard effusion cell uh, just doesn't work anymore because the cells completely break down. If we look at a comparison between the two common techniques for oxide growth, so molecular beam epitaxy on the one hand and pulse laser deposition on the other hand, we see that these techniques have very different characteristics. On the MBE side, it has the advantage that you can use um, absorption controlled growth because you can tune the fluxes of the elements uh, individually. This also means that MBE is very good at slowly varying dopants and and changing composition uh, at a local scale. Also, MBE has an advantage that the source material is much purer than the material you can get at a BLD target, simply because you use elemental metal and these can be refined up to extremely high purity. 
But the MBE also has also very significant downsides. So the entire system with all the effusion sources becomes technologically very complex. And most of this complexity is inside the vacuum chamber. So if something breaks there, it's quite a big problem. This complexity increases with the operating temperature of the cell, and especially if corrosive gases are present. So in the case of oxide epitaxy, you can't really put a lot of oxygen into, into the chamber simply because the heater switch heats the effusion cells burn in the presence of oxygen. And finally, MBE has limited flexibility. So if you decide next week, I want to grow a certain material with MBE, you are limited to the elements which are already um, present in your growth chamber. So a typical situation in, for an MBE grower is if you want to grow a new set of materials, the first thing you do is actually write a grant for a new MBE system with which you can grow the materials. But laser deposition is quite complementary to this. Um, intrinsically, the situation in the vacuum chamber is very simple. You need a mechanical holder to uh, hold a compressed target. And the only other thing which is required is a line of sight to a viewport um, with which you can hit it with a laser. And this laser is, of course, very complex, but it has the big advantage that it is outside of the vacuum system. And therefore, completely independent from the vacuum system itself. And because laser light interacts very weakly um, with anything in the vacuum system, PLD is compatible with a wide range of background gases up to quite high pressures. Furthermore, because the target structure is so simple, you can transfer targets in and out of the vacuum chamber. So if you decide to grow a certain material next week, the only limitation you have is whether you can buy a target of this material. Once you have this, you can use a standard transfer, put this material into your chamber, and you're good to go. You know, these downsides are, it's hard to control stoichiometry precisely. Um, if you work at low pressure, the particle energies involved become very high, and this can damage the samples. And finally, the process also admits uh, larger particles up to hundreds of nanometers in size, which end up at the top of your sample. So we set out with the idea to combine the good points in this slide and try to eliminate most of the bad points. So the structure is the following. We do an approach where we use only external power sources. And these are obviously going to be lasers. We want to use absorption controlled growth as much as possible, meaning we need tunable fluxes of every constituent of the film. All the positions should be at thermal energies. The technique should be suitable for all the elements. And we want to have the flexibility of target transfers. So this looks like this. This is thermal laser epitaxy. We have a very simple vacuum system into which is a substrate, which is heated by a laser, and elemental sources, which are each individually heated by a laser. These lasers are continuous waves. So the only thing what the lasers do is they heat the target until evaporation starts. Because we use an individual laser for every target, um, we can tune the flux of every element simply by tuning the laser power. Um, everything else is very simple, meaning we can still put uh, background pressure into the system, um, as will be discussed later. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus about the evaporation part of the metals. And this is what this looks like in practice. So this is silicon. This is a picture taken during operation. The target is 12 millimeters in diameter. And in the center here, you see this bright spot. And this is the place where the laser beam hits the target. This is the hottest spot um, in the system. Around that, you see this darker area here. This is the part of the silicon which is molten. So what we have here as a situation is we are evaporating locally from the hottest point in the chamber. And the molten silicon is contained uh, by solid silicon. So this gives us the 
cleanest possible sources because there is no contact to any crucible material and also there is no surrounding elements which are hotter and we, which could contaminate uh, the deposition. Um, lasers have uh, pretty much arbitrarily power density and therefore you can go to very high temperatures. As demonstrated here with the case of tantalum, we took a thin tantalum rod, which is 10 millimeter in length, three millimeter in diameter, and is kept in place by a very simple tantalum support. We irradiate the top side of the structure with a laser um, and measure the temperature with a thermal couple at the bottom. On the right, you see again a picture during operation, this time taken from the side. And what you see is this gradient um, in the color. And this corresponds to a gradient in temperature. This gradient was very large. At the top surface, we had molten tantalum, and tantalum melts at 3000 degrees centigrade. At the bottom, we measured the temperature of about 1000 degrees centigrade. So over this 10 millimeters, we achieved a temperature gradient of 2000 degrees centigrade. And this high temperature gradient suggests that the technique is uh, very power efficient, simply because we need to heat. So when we achieve a high temperature, but only in a very small volume. So therefore we can achieve this with a relatively low power. In this case, this was achieved with 280 watts of power. To quantify this a bit more, um, we have done tests with a set of low vapor pressure elements. And all of them we could grow at significant rates of up to several angstrom per second using powers less than 500 watts. If you compare this to an MBE effusion cell, a high temperature effusion cell at 500 watts gives you about 15 to 1600 degrees centigrade. In the case of tungsten over here, we were operating at 3500 degrees. Uh, finally, we also made some samples. So during the, uh, all these tests, we gathered a material on a two inch silicon substrate, um, which gets homogeneously coated with whatever metal we are depositing. Uh, you can see that there is actually coatings present because you have these little points here, which are the fingers uh, for the substrate support, which are not, not covered during the deposition. Um, we grew layers up to thicknesses of several hundreds of nanometers. We could, we could also uh, grow less than one nanometer homogeneously. So this brings me to a summary of this first part. Um, this is the periodic table as the status of uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we have achieved a successful deposition of all the elements we have tried so far. And we have tried about two thirds of the relevant elements for evaporation. Moreover, we tried all the extremes in parameter space. So high vapor pressure, low vapor pressure, high thermal conduction, low thermal conduction, et cetera. And therefore, we are very confident that the remaining ones can be grown by TLE as well. As an outlook, uh, we plan to combine this evaporation setup um, with a substrate heater, which will be discussed later on, into a proper uh, epitaxy system, which would have a growth chamber, storage chamber, load lock. Um, the possibility to use up to five different sources simultaneously, read monitoring, etc. And because the scope of uh, this technique is way beyond whatever we can do as a single group here, uh, we plan to make this system com commercially available as well, uh, so that other groups can join in the fun. So this brings me to the end of this part. I've introduced the basics of uh, thermal laser evaporation a new deposition technique that is clean, simple, fast, and versatile. Thank you for your attention. Hey, Kevin, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, all right, so um, one of the things, because you, you mentioned that, uh, the, that you're working on a path forward towards commercialization. So let's say I have an MBE system in my lab. 
<clears throat> and I want to hook this on. Um, what are the limitation um, in terms of size? Because it looks like they're fairly large lasers. And then the other thing that I'm wondering, because you're using the laser and you, you, you're using about a micron wavelength to, to heat metals, um, the, the metals reflect at those wavelengths. And I'm wondering if you have such a high intensity laser and you're shooting this in your reactor, how do you make sure, just from a safety perspective, that this is not going to be a problem? So that's a lot of questions at one. Um, so maybe let's start with the safety. So our, what we do is we build custom systems for TLE. So the first safety rule is close off everything. So there is no eyesight into the chamber whatsoever. Secondly, to deal with a reflected beam. So you're right that for every metal, it's about 30 to 50% gets absorbed, the rest gets reflected. Um, but we know where the reflected light goes because it's just a direct reflection. At that point, you can put an optical absorber and you use water cooling to get the heat out of the system. Um, regarding the space aspect, the space of the high power lasers isn't such a big aspect. So lasers are nowadays available at high powers um, at inserts, which you can just put in 19 inch racks and place if you, if you want them very far away. So we have one example where we have the lasers actually in a different lab and we just drill the hole through the wall and put the cable through. And this is because the beam delivery goes by uh, optical fibers. So at the deposition system, what you need is an entrance port, some optics, and the place where you can stick the, the fiber in. The, it is, however, not straightforward to combine this technique with an existing MBE system, simply because MBE systems have lots of ports on the bottom side for mounting infusion cells. Uh, what we need is lots of ports at the top side because the you need a line of sight to the surface of the uh, source material and then the reflecting beam then also goes up again and you need also a port at this absorber position so how's it in terms of scaling up let's say we're not talking about a research size system we're talking about a let's say a six inch or eight inch system because you're gonna need more power because in order to get your flux uniformity across a six or an eight inch wafer, this is a very different problem than doing this for like two or three inch. So uh, uh, is it possible to scale up the power of the lasers that you, can, that you can achieve this or do you have to go with multiple sources then that are being fed by, diff by different lasers or how are you guys planning on doing this? So in the first approximation, you scale exactly the same as an MBE system. So if the waiver gets bigger, the sources gets placed a bit further away and a bit more to the outside. And then, of course, if you want to keep the growth rate constant, you have to scale laser power. Um, the advantage is that high power lasers become more and more readily available. So we do a lot now with 500 watt lasers. The same series goes to 2 kilowatts. In principle, another factor of 10 is doable there. Um, if you run into the limits of lasers, you can always go to multiple lasers, um, scanning for um, fine adjusting the, the, the thickness profile, etc. But in the first approximation, I would just scale the distances, increase the laser power. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, can I ask a question, a really quick question uh, about your laser operation? So uh, how often do you have to uh, repolish your target surface? I guess just like PLD, you, you keep laser operating your surface and uh, it's getting rougher and you will uh, change the gross rate later on. And I guess because this MD, you don't change if, after every single experiment, right? You don't have to repolish the, the target surface so it will be flat for the next experiment? Um, yeah, what you want to do is you want to match the, the spot size of the laser to approximately the size of the, the target so that you burn this target down homogeneously um, 
and then you're good to go. Um, another trick which helps a lot is um, between the position runs, you can heat the target to higher temperatures, melt the entire surface, and then you're back to a clean state. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, I pass the word on to my colleague, Dong Yang. Hello, uh, my name is Dong Kim, and I'm working on the growth of oxide films by the thermal laser evaporation. I, this is a prototype tele chamber for the oxide film growth. Infrared laser is used for heating the source, and the, all events inside the chamber is recorded by some cameras. Sorry. And what you see in front of the picture is the ozone generator. So a part of oxygen is converted into ozone and the ozone accounts for 10 weight percent of the total flow. And the oxidizing gas is injected into the chamber through the manual valve. And the manual valve is constantly open during the deposition for ensuring the same gas flow. And inside the chamber, Substrate and the elemental source are placed on each holder with 60 millimeter working distance. In this study, we used two inches silicon substrate, and the thermal couples are positioned on the back side of the substrate and at the bottom of the source for the temperature sensing. And here, I perform the theory of pure elemental sources in oxidizing ambient on unheated silicon substrate. And the oxidizing gas pressure is in a range of below 10 to minus 7 hectopascal to 10 to minus 2 hectopascal. And during the test, I observed we, we can see the temperature pressure drop under the laser radiation. And this is the chamber pressure decrease during the titanium, dep titanium deposition. And this means the injected gas is used for the oxidation. And considering that oxidation is more active at the higher temperature, then this temperature drop is mainly attributed to the source oxidation. And indeed, we observed the oxidized source after the test. So the molecular flux from the source material may be generated by both metallic part of source and by the oxidized source then it would be curious whether the oxide film can be grown stably in this configuration in which laser interact the metal oxide complex system. And I would say yes. And we observe the polycrystalline oxide films on the substrate. So we were able to grow the polycrystalline films from the self-supporting pure element sources. And now we have tested 15 elements. And from the sublimating element zinc to the refractory materials like molybdenum, ruthenium, successfully formed polycrystalline oxide films on the substrate. And this table summarize the oxide phases we have observed. In case of titanium, vanadium, and molybdenum produced multiple oxide phases depending on the oxidizing gas pressure. And other elements formed a single oxidation state within the test range. So the TLD method is applicable for the wide range of elements with the same ratio and the identical geometry. And it is quite suitable for the growth of oxide films. And now let's talk about the 
oxidizing gas pressure dependencies. And this is the X-ray depression patterns of the TLE grown titanium films without oxidation gas. Of course, ti metallic titanium formed on the substrate and with the oxidizing gas injection, the film becomes oxidized into the monoclinic, sorry, self-stoichiometric titanium monoxide and then the titanium dioxide in metallic phase and the titanium dioxide in anatomic phase. At the higher pressure, like a 10 to minus two hectopascal, amorphous oxide film formed. And this is due to the thermal energy loss of the vapor species. And that is also reflected in the temperature, substrate temperature drop like this. And also the oxidizing gas pressure affect the deposition rate of the elements. And this shows the deposition rate of titanium and nickel depending on the oxidizing gas pressure. These two elements show quite different tendencies. Titanium, deposition rate of titanium increases with the oxidizing gas pressure increases. But deposition rate of titanium certainly decreases as the temperature increases over the 10 to minus 3 hectopascal. Indeed, these are the two representative tendencies we have observed in the TLA experiment. Iron, cobalt, niobium, zinc, molybdenum shows titan like behavior. And the chromium, scandium, manganese, and vanadium shows nick like behavior. This kind of pressure dependency can be explained by the difference in the vapor pressure of the metallic source and the oxidized source. As the oxidation gas pressure increases, so it becomes more oxidized. So if the, if the oxidized source have the higher vapor pressure than the metal, then the deposition rate will increase like a titanium did. In contrast, if the metal vapor pressure is higher than vapor pressure of its oxide, the deposition rate can be decreases like a nickel showed. And based on these observations, we can qualitatively describe the TLA process. Let's take in a copper as an example. Considering our experimental condition, the liquid phase of copper is the most stable phase. Indeed, we can observe the metallic phase like surface at the laser spot area after the test. So the main vapor species generated from the source is the copper vapor. And this copper vapor can be react with the oxygen gases on the substrate. Since the substrate is not heated, so copper monoxide is preferred than the other oxide phases. And this is the result. And nowadays we are working on the epitaxy. For this, we added additional infrared razor for heating the substrate. And the surface, surface temperature of substrate is measured by the pyrometer attached to this side. And now the aluminum sapphire substrate or the magnesium oxide substrate are used for the epitaxy. And these oxide substrates are transparent for the IR laser. So the platinum was sputtered on the backside of the substrate. And this is the measured substrate temperature. And since the emissivity was set as one, it, this guaranteed the row bound of the real substrate temperature. And first, we try to deposit the vanadium oxide on the aluminum substrate, uh, aluminum oxide substrate. And we found, found a proper condition which produced the epitaxial film on the substrate. And this shows the vanadium oxide with monoclinic phase and also have epitaxial relation with the sapphire substrate. It was grown at 10 to minus 3 to Pascal and the substrate temperature was 600 degrees C. And then I worked on the ruthenium which is a kind of chore making elements. And even for this, we, were, we succeeded in growing the epitaxially ruthenium oxide on the magnesium oxide. 
And also you can clearly see the two rectangular domains with 90 degree rotation relation formed on the magnesium oxide substrate. Okay, let me summarize my presentation. Uh, TLA has many advantages for the growth of oxide films and we successfully applied the TLA for the oxide simple growth. And also we demonstrate the thermal ledger at taxi. Thanks for your attention. So uh, if there is no question, then let's move on to the last presentation. Okay, welcome. My name is Wolfgang Braun, and I would finally like to address uh, the other main component of the system, which is the uh, substrate heater. We employ the same principle like for the sources, um, as you see in the left part here. Now the substrate as well is heated directly by a laser. In contrast to the, um, the second chamber for the oxide growth that you just saw, where we still needed to resort for a tweaked uh, heating laser for substrate heating. We now want to heat the substrate directly and overcome the problem that the IR radiation at one micron is not absorbed by typical oxide substrates. So if you look at the spectrum of uh, strontium titanate, for example, uh, most other oxide substrates look the same. The red line indicates the wavelength of the IR laser, the standard fiber laser, and it's uh, practically not absorbed at all by the material. However, we are lucky there is another high power commercially available laser, which is the CO2 laser out there at 10 microns. And at this wavelength, uh, the absorption is extremely good. So after 300 microns, more than 95% of the power of the incoming laser is absorbed. An example is shown on the right of our by now fourth generation beamline design to heat such substrates. Uh, uh, they uh, contain a beam forming uh, component that produces, in this case, we set it to the seven and a half millimeter diameter, which is optimized for five by five square millimeter substrates. However, we were using a 10 by 10 sapphire substrate uh, piece in this case. We uh, use a roughly ground backside to increase the, uh, further increase the coupling to the beam. And what you see is the irradiated spot after the experiment with uh, some uh, surface melting within the entire area and then uh, full melting of the uh, backside of the substrate in the central area. With this setup, this is uh, possible uh, with a laser power of only 38 watts uh, at the melting point of sapphire of uh, 2040 degrees C. These are experiments that we've done uh, previously. The first uh, chambers we tested this setup on uh, were our PLD chambers. So here's an example uh, by Arno uh, uh, Chiomo et al, where they grew a strontium zirconate buffer layer to tweak the lattice constant and adjust it for the subsequent uh, BSO growth. The image on the right shows a snapshot during the pulsed laser deposition. You see in blue, faint, faint blue, the uh, um, deposition plume, in this case coming from above. And then the image was taken through a double window pane uh, at, at some angle. So you get double reflections and therefore multiple images of the actual substrate. So each of these stacked uh, superimposed images is uh, attenuated by a factor of 650. And the top one then finally shows you a ghost or mirror uh, image of the substrate itself, five by five by one millimeter uh, in thickness, in this case of terbium scandate. 
Note also that the uh, melting point of the metal substrate holder is only 1,300 degrees C, whereas uh, the substrate uh, in this case is at 1,600 and the substrate uh, sapphire, for example, can easily go to 2,000 degrees C. This is sort of the inversion of uh, the uh, uh, rule for the uh, one micron laser, which absorbs very well, is very well absorbed by the metals and therefore ideal for the sources. Here we have the opposite. The long wavelength laser is very well absorbed by the oxides, but uh, efficiently reflected by the metal and therefore the metal substrate holder remains cool, which is a uh, uh, nice to have thing. We don't need to worry about that uh, too much. Actually, uh, apart from substrate heating, the main application in our case is to prepare substrates. And we do this in a similar way, like is done in uh, 3.5 Epitaxy, by simply introducing a uh, pre-cleaned substrate, um, which is basically degreased, no um, actual chemical treatment done, uh, to high temperatures so that atoms can move on the surface and uh, even dissolve and uh, thereby the, uh, form the terrace structure, which is usually given by the um, minimum or the, the miscut of the substrate. This is an example of magnesium oxide. At the bottom right, you see the temperature profile. In this case, we go up to 1,700 degrees C. And then we obtain the uh, step train seen in different magnifications in the top, at the top of the uh, slide. The uh, terraces are nice and straight. The roughness that you see on top of it is most probably due to a reaction with moisture in the air as it was taken out um, and transferred through air to, for the AFM images to be taken. At the bottom left, you see the read image at the hottest temperature. We have chosen uh, an interval, an annealing interval of 200 seconds such that the uh, uh, time we stay there can be uh, easily controlled and is accurate enough. Oops. I jumped one. Next example here is um, sapphire. We stop the preparation here at different temperatures to basically do a snapshot movie of uh, the evolution of the process. To the left, you see the, the surface configuration after stopping at 1300 degrees C. Um, the step, um, steps are still meandering. The, you don't have really straight edges. Uh, but uh, in addition, you also see an additional height uh, different from the fundamental step height. So there are condensed patches of something else with a different height in AFM. Most probably something like OH that is still absorbed to the surface and then forms um, a covering layer. At uh, 1,450, this additional height is gone. We have only single uh, steps that correspond to the lattice constant of the material. However, the, we still have islands and meandering step edges, uh, depending also on the miscut and the terrace size. And only at around 1,470, we get the uh, optimum configuration where we have single steps and rather straight uh, terrace edges, still trying to follow the hexagonal symmetry, but overall um, perpendicular to the miscut of the substrate. As we go on to 1,500 degrees C, uh, double steps nucleate. And now, because this process happens independently um, of each other laterally on the surface, we basically get domain patches of double steps that are uh, off by one step laterally. And that's why uh, this domain boundary you can observe by splitting or joining of single steps uh, of, uh, of these uh, uh, parts, uh, for example, a patch like that or something like that. Going still higher in temperature, this process continues. Step bunching becomes more pronounced until at uh, temperatures very close to the melting point, you get uh, very high assembled uh, bunch steps but also a very large single terraces in between as shown in the bottom right. So you have terraces of several microns um, uh, extending in each direction, something that maybe you would want to use to put an entire prototype device on a single uh, terrace if you can uh, find it or identify it uh, on the surface. This is the read pattern we get from such a thermally prepared sapphire substrate. 
It has a complicated surface reconstruction, but the fact that you can no longer identify the fundamental peaks uh, implies that the domain size of uh, the surface uh, reconstruction, which has quite a large surface unit cell, is uh, the same like the terraces or the resolution of the read, whichever um, is uh, smaller. So we obtain very high quality surfaces by simply heating the substrates in a clean environment. And this takes place directly before deposition. So it's done with every sample. We um, clean it, prepare it, go down to the deposition temperature, and then you can do your epitaxy right away in the same chamber under the same conditions. This uh, method also works for perovskites, in this case, uh, uh, ternary compounds, in this case, this frozen scandate. Again, you see the temperature profile is basically the same. Uh, um, how you heat uh, at which rate and how you cool at which rate we found uh, makes no uh, difference. It's uh, important how long you stay up there. Now, in this case, you have two um, constituents of the oxide. And uh, as um, Hans already uh, talked about in the, uh, discussing the adsorption control growth, you have a more volatile component now. And you can selectively, in addition to preparing the morphology, you can selectively evaporate the more volatile compound and also prepare a chemically or uh, in terms of surface uh, reconstruction uniform surface with a uniform uh, surface chemistry, which um, is ideal for subsequent epitaxial growth. In this case as well, a temperature variation shows a uh, very similar behavior like on the sapphire. At lower temperatures, meandering uh, step edges with islands uh, on them, then still wavy edges uh, at higher temperatures until there is an optimum. In this case, around 1,400 degrees C for this material, above which, um, again, you see a tendency for step bunching. The final example here is uh, strontium titanate, our, again, uh, standard um, benchmark system, and it works for strontium titanate as well. Temperatures are typically between 1,400 and 1,300 for the preparation. It depends on the uh, thickness uh, of the substrate. So um, when you take this temperature and place it in this phase diagram, this is uh, at the position of the red dot here, which matches it, uh, the uh, theory very well. The horizontal band is the range of uh, pressures that we typically have uh, in terms of uh, deposition or desorption. So the 10 to the minus seven would be uh, corresponding to one monolayer in about 100 seconds the 10 to the minus five to one monolayer per second. So the one monolayer in 100, or in our case, 200 seconds during the annealing um, matches very well with this temperature of 1,300. And again, marks this boundary between the PLV or MBE regime down here into the uh, promised land of uh, thermal laser epitaxy, where we uh, want to boldly go now. Uh, there was the question about scaling. Here are a few numbers for the substrate heater. Uh, for this uh, example that I showed you, we have a temperature of 1,600 degrees C, uh, a power requirement of 250 watts. This uh, depends a lot and has a wide range depending on the uh, emittance of the material. Uh, so you need some overhead if you want to cover a wide range of substrate materials. Uh, for uh, this example uh, of CO2 lasers, uh, 20 kilowatt uh, lasers are uh, uh, commercially available currently, which uh, means we could immediately scale this uh, to uh, 20 centimeters square or two inch. However, we think that by also by uh, increasing the uh, efficiency of our waveguide and the beam shaping optics, we could still uh, go, um, we think a lot beyond that. So here are the advantages of uh, substrate heating uh, with uh, direct coupling to the substrate. You don't need anything else like a metal layer on the back or um, a metal piece. You have unlimited temperatures. It's homogeneous, stable, and reproducible. Uh, you are very agile on the way up and on the way down, which, for example, allows you to freeze in uh, if, you, if you do a growth process 
uh, when you uh, simply turn off your laser, you achieve cooling rates exceeding uh, 400 kelvins per second. And you can basically freeze in your morphology and uh, look at it with AFM. The, uh, we find that the most important application, however, is this uh, possibility to do in situ uh, thermal substrate preparation right before growth to prepare an extremely nice and clean uh, surface. So we expect that this leads to improved layer quality, new growth possibilities, as mentioned by Hans, and uh, also improved throughput with uh, having these high rates on the way up and down. So thank you very much for your attention for this part. Are there any questions on this? Feel free to unmute yourselves, um, ask questions to Wolfgang, or if you have questions on any of the other talks. I have a question. So I recognize that you're using two different ramp up rates when you heat the substrates. You're starting with a steep one and then you go to a shallower one. Is there a particular reason why you do this? Uh, for the final approach, we would like to use a slower rate so that we uh, can define the point better at which the um, annealing starts. All these processes are thermally activated, so they have an exp exponential dependence on temperature. We don't want to have a significant overshoot at the beginning, which would uh, make it less reproducible. But other than that, there is no significance to it. So it's basically just uh, the, the technological game of PID control and um, yeah, how you how agile and precisely you can uh, handle the laser. There's no real uh, point beyond that uh, other than this. Finally, actually, I have still a, a few more slides, if you don't mind. Um, just about two or three weeks ago, um, we uh, put the next chamber in operation, and uh, we have a, the very first benchmark numbers on this system. This is now a system which combines all these elements. Uh, you remember first was uh, the, 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 the one system we study the basics of uh, metal, pure metal evaporation in UHV. Second system focuses on the evaporation in oxygen atmosphere. Uh, we have the uh, CO2 laser, and now we combine all this in a system. And here are a few uh, first numbers, uh, which I think uh, demonstrate the potential that this uh, method has. We uh, uh, tried or we deposited uh, ruthenium on sapphire. These are a few read images. So uh, here on the left, there is uh, the sapphire substrate as loaded, um, basically just degreased and transferred into the chamber. Uh, obviously it's at room temperature. The base pressure of the chamber is six and a half times 10 to the minus 11 hectopascal. We then heat the uh, substrate to 1,600 degrees C on the backside, which corresponds to this single double step train system on the uh, step train system on the epitaxial uh, growth surface. Uh, as you can see, we uh, need about 32 watts for this. Uh, the laser heating is very efficient uh, for sapphire. The chamber pressure increases to seven and a half times 10 to minus 11 during this annealing process. We then go down to 1000 degrees C, substrate laser heater is at 16 watts. The source is now uh, ramped up to 170 watts and we start uh, nucleating the epitaxial deposition. At this time, the chamber pressure rises up to three and a half to uh, times 10 to minus 10 hectopascal. At the end of the growth, around 10 minutes later, the layer thickness has reached uh, 10 nanometers. Substrate temperature is still the same, source laser power and laser power of the substrate heater, uh, same thing. The chamber pressure has gone down a little bit to two times 10 to the minus 10. And then after deposition, uh, we obtain the uh, uh, read pattern that you see here. Um, a quite a nice read pattern with narrow uh, streaks of the metal epitaxial layer and nice Kikuchi lines. Um, the pressure is back into the 10 to the minus 11 hectopascal range. At the bottom, you see uh, uh, some of our first test runs. Uh, also, the uh, 
throughput um, feature that I uh, mentioned uh, is realized here already. We uh, can easily grow three, four layers a day, just one after the other. Okay, this is finally the true final slide of everything. So if you have a further question, all three of us are now available um, for discussion. Yeah, come over. Thanks for the uh, talk. Um, I'm not a crystal grower, but um, I'm curious um, what materials you think could benefit from this uh, new mode of growth in comparison to existing methods? Well, probably, probably all. <laughs> um, we think that you uh, can combine ultra pure, uh, make combinations of ultra pure uh, elements. In particular, uh, simple combinations at first, binary ternary compounds, but then, I mean, uh, so far we have just evaporated um, elements, single elements, but you could also think about um, evaporating compounds and assembling combinations of molecules for more complicated uh, structures. This is just stretching the surface at the moment. I mean, we, um, we're going through the elements and through the simple oxides and from there on, um, uh, as you combine them into combinations and compounds, um, yeah, it's endless. You don't see any intrinsic uh, showstopper somewhere that says this will never grow gallium arsenide as good as the MBE grow in gallium arsenide or such, such constraints. Uh, I don't see why it shouldn't work uh, as, at least as well um, uh, for gallium arsenide as MBE. However, uh, in particular for um, 3,5 MBE, the, um, uh, because of the reasons that Hans mentioned, you, the elements can be already evaporated with high purity with conventional sources. Uh, the delta that we could possibly put on top is rather small. So uh, it's probably more um, promising right now to look for materials that uh, so far have been completely uh, out of the range. Uh, when you think about all these elements uh, like uh, carbon, boron, uh, iridium, uh, tungsten, whatever, that you now can combine in any combination, uh, that's probably uh, the, the direction to go first. Will you be able to grow graphene or has that no boron nitride this way? Um, probably, yes. Uh, the problem there may rather be the source that um, you need to find a, um, a carbon modification that you can evaporate such that you produce single atoms instead of flakes and chunks that arrive on your, sur on your surface. But we haven't tried yet. We have evaporated carbon. It produces nice dense films. Uh, but we haven't gone into uh, uh, details in characterizing it yet. Thank you. Any students on the call that would like to ask a question? We got a silent bunch today. <clears throat> Everybody's done. Well, they're starting to send in thanks for the talk. Um, so thank you, um, Hans and Dong Yang and uh, Wolfgang. Um, if you could stay on for just a couple of minutes, just in case somebody didn't want to ask during the recording, um, and then we'll go ahead and close out this session. But right now I'll close the recording. Yeah, I mean, if you have any uh, question, contact us by email or whatever. Um, you'll find us through the uh, coordinates given here. We'd be happy to hear from you. <laughs>